All right, so this is how the class works. Um, so it's called Women's Issues, right? So I try to be as comprehensive as I can. And so uh, when I do the goddesses, what I'm doing is just sort of life trajectory, like her whole life, what, what she feels, you know, there's poetry, but, but again, I emphasize that in my other class on goddesses, but she, what she was like as a child, all these things. So that's sort of your, your archetype. But then the second day, I focus on specifically a movement, right? Echo feminism. And so this is a movement that's a combination of an intellectual movement. So it's very Apollonian in the sense that women are using their reason, they're writing papers and books, they're going to conferences, and they're trying to formulate in language a way of looking at the world that is eco-feminist, right? So the goddess thing is a way of living, but the second day is a way of thinking and then a critique of the male ways of thinking that affect their way of living that have created a certain culture that's very difficult for women to function in, right? Um, so if you remember way at the beginning, we had this story of the goddesses before the patriarchy arrived. And then we had stories of the goddesses after that, and they had been wounded. So now we have these movements, um, the eco-feminist movement, is all about how women uh, need to rethink and they need to critique the male way of thinking and living. And then they end up critiquing each other also. So, so this is a, you know, a very sophisticated, controversial, anytime there's any new kind of movement, when the feminist movement began, the reason it was pervasive, the reason it, um, there were so many divisions in it, the reasons women disagreed was because it's about everything. So when you're critiquing patriarchy, you're critiquing everything. And of course, different women are focused on different aspects of it. So in general, the Artemis type of woman would be focused on ecological issues, right? She would be the animal rights person. She would be the um, uh, environmentalist, wilderness protection person. And she's also uh, a midwife, like she protects women against abusive men. So she tends to, you know, get involved with trafficking. But this is not the only goddess type that'll do it, right? And so you can see in the environment, the eco-feminist, the chapter on eco-feminism, you can see that some of the women eco-feminists focus on uh, care, care for the earth and care for women. And then other eco-feminists say, no, <laughs> We don't want that because then that forces women to be responsible and men should also care, right? So you can see sort of these uh, disagreements among women who identify with the eco-feminist school of thought. So, um, so that's what I'm trying to put together, these uh, archetypes with these social movements. And um, just to give you each of you this chance to think about everything, <laughs> right? I just throw this stuff out at you and you react, right? You're gonna read something and, and it's gonna, something is gonna stick to you. Something you read today sticks out to you. Now, um, and that's how you learn about yourself, right? You learn about 
how, your orientation toward the world and which aspects of women's issues. I mean, I would assume you care about all of it, but you have to focus, right? So your life is going to focus on certain aspects more than others, but women should all work together and they should support each other and not get divided against each other. So that's sort of um, how the class is going to go. Um, so for today, I had one chapter on the movement, like this certain intellectual subclass of women's issues and all the divisions. And then I had a paper with one specific event, right? The garment industry in Bangladesh. And then I only gave you the first eight pages, but I think you can anticipate what else might be in it. And you might want to read it. You, it's long. You might want to include it uh, in, you have to do a research paper. So you pick which um, aspect of women's issues you want to research. So if you want to pursue animal rights as your research paper topic, just start on it right now. You know, don't wait until two days before it's due, right? Do it now. Um, if you know you want to focus on trafficking, if you know you want to, you know, you want to focus on wilderness protection, you can just go ahead. Um, let's see. All right. So that's, and then I asked you to bring your own examples. Bring your own examples because one of the main issues in this chapter is that women, it's, well, this is Artemis' perspective. We also have Demeter's perspective. We have these other goddesses' perspectives on this. But because women are in charge of nurturing kids and feeding kids, the destruction of the earth very much affects their lives, right? If there isn't enough water and they have to walk farther every day to get water or pay more, or if there isn't enough um, wood to cook food and stay warm, they're the ones that have to go and walk farther to get wood. Um, if, if the wilderness protection people protect the forests and they don't have anything to burn, <laughs> to keep the, the stove going and, and cook the food, they're the ones that'll end up burning weeds or something and causing pollution. <laughs> but anyway, women uh, suffer a lot because of environmental destruction that uh, was caused by men. So the destruction is caused by uh, colonialists, white, right? White, Western men, most of all. And then next in line is white Western women. And so the people at the bottom of the rung there are non-white, non-Western, poor women, right? And so they tend to suffer. So, um, but eco-feminists, are women of privilege, right? They are writing papers and books. They have PhDs. They have a lot of natural ability. They had a lot of opportunity. They had education. Yes, the Chipko movement and the Green Belt movement. Yes, very good. So Safia, um, so people can check the chat. I mean, and again, you can do research on the Chipko movement and the Green Belt movement. That's all great. Um, the Yeah, and it's just what I want you to do is when you bring in your own examples, um, that we start building this whole culture. You become aware that in your time, and this is, the book was written long ago. I mean, it's been um, added to, but the point is um, it's, it's never going to contain everything. And so keeping up with all these movements is what you do, right? So you add to this whole history 
you show how the women in the 60s and 70s that started this, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, originally, the book did not have a chapter on post-colonialism, right? Because that wasn't a thing. I mean, it was going on, <laughs> but it wasn't yet a school of thought. And that's very revealing, right? That women focus first on the things that were closest to them. And, they're, and so what you need to keep in mind and call out when you see it is how much of this just is, it's Western privileged white women. They have a bias when they're talking about these things. Uh, because I, I can see it to some extent. It makes it a lot easier for me to see it when I'm teaching women in developing countries, right? Then it just pops out at me. Um, before I taught at AUW, I would imagine things and I would, you know, research some things. But you can, you have, I mean, collectively, you have a lot to say and you are part of this huge cultural shift. So it's a matter of just getting you on board and getting you exposed to all sorts of stuff. And so as you move forward in your careers and you have to narrow, you have to get narrower and get better and better, um, you will always support women in those other who went a different direction and went in all these other directions. So that's sort of the general idea. Um, so I'll go to the outline. I made an outline of the chapter, but does anybody have a question? What I'm gonna do is I am gonna talk for a while because I don't, I'm just not sure if you're all ready to talk in groups or not. But I guess I will, if you're not ready to, to engage in a breakout session, please listen to what I say so that you are ready to engage, right? Pick something from what I said so that you went, when you get into the great breakout group, you can talk. I, it, it really does disappoint me when I throw stuff at students and I give them all sorts of ideas and then I go into the breakout group and nobody has anything to say. So I just, it's confusing to me because it's so hard for me to think that you don't know this is really important for your life, right? And I don't know if you've, some of you have been so trained to just spit back whatever the teacher says that you just, are frozen, like you don't know what to do. But I think every group will have a couple students who are, are already think on their own. I want you by the end of this class to know you have to have your own mind. You have to think about stuff. You have to develop um, opinions that are always open to change, right? But you have to start becoming your own person and developing your own perspective. That's what college is for. So let me just go with the outline for a while and then we'll have time to go into breakout groups. And then, um, right, okay. So we'll go into breakout groups. I'll ask somebody to be the leader of each group and they make sure everybody says something. And then everybody reports back to the big group because then we can have it on the YouTube channel. And also we can start building our, you know, our minds, our ability to see with our minds all the things that are going on. Because if you start linking everything to everything, then things will come to mind. And that's what it means to have a liberated mind, right? Liberal education, you liberate your mind. So you liberate it from your particular circumstances, you liberate it from your particular upbringing, and you, and you just learn how to connect things together 
so that when you're musing, right, one piece of news will come up, you can connect it to all these other things. And then you can be creative. You can make better decisions about what sort of life choices to make. You can keep your, your uh, thoughts, your life in perspective. And most of all, you can always respect other people and realize that we're all in this together. And each of us can only do one small bit of what it takes. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So let's go to the outline here. All right. Um, and I, and again, I don't know, I think some of you, what I say will be sort of obvious. Others will be, you know, it'll help a lot if I elaborate on some of this stuff. So I'll just kind of elaborate, but not, you know, spend a lot of time on it. So we did cover last time the Artemis types. Now the echo feminists and their relationship to other schools of thought. So there are, is a certain school of thought that just focuses on global the globalization of the economy in general, right? And what it's done uh, for good and for bad in the um, post-colonial era. Um, so the global will focus on the economics. The post-colonial will focus on all aspects of culture, the way that colonial, colonialists tried to control people's beliefs and their religion and their customs and habits and all sorts, their way of life, not just an economic situation. I mean, it was certainly motivated by economics, but it had a lot, of more, lot more um, implications. Then the transnational um, trying to form something um, international, mainstream, privileged, white feminists, right? So those are the ones that started the feminist movement. They were privileged white and they had rather mainstream lives. Um, but the focus, what brings them all together is the domination of the non-human world. Um, it's conceptual. What does she mean when she says, conceptual, symbolic, and linguistic, right? That's what I'm wondering if you read these words. And <laughs> okay, so the concepts, what's the concept of nature, the concept of women? Um, how is it that um, the, the mindset, right? And the concept of objectivity, right? Men were claiming to be detached observers of things. And of course, they're not. <laughs> they're very engaged. And they, um, they create a whole conceptual scheme, a whole worldview that serves their interests. So, um, so if you want to change the society to make it more sustainable, you've got to change your whole conceptual framework. Then you've got symbolic, um, that's um, art is symbolic, right? Like a, a flag is a symbol. So what sort of things um, symbolize um, ecofeminism? What are, what's the symbolic sort of um, framework? And then the linguistic. So how is language used? And how has it been used? And how should it be used? Um, just to give you one example of more recent, but it's really outrageous. And I, I fear that it's going to become a lot more common. I don't know if it will in your countries, but I'm really afraid in my country about this. So I was at the laundromat and the, and the TV was on and it's usually on Fox News or some dang thing. 
and they were talking about climate change and I couldn't believe it, right? Ha, huh, somebody's acknowledging this. And they were interviewing scientists and the scientists were saying, this is a terrible problem. And I'm just like glued <laughs> to the TV. But then, then is this is the power of an ideology, conceptual scheme is what I'm about to say, right? So as we start experiencing climate catastrophes, the way I think about it is we've been wounding mother nature and she's trying to heal, right? She's just trying to heal herself because we've wounded her, right? She's trying to get away from us so that she can recover, but that's not the way it, they were discussing it. They were saying, Mother Nature is at war against us. This is a war. We have to fight back. Mother Nature is out to get us. She's going to kill us. <laughs> and they said, hurricanes are as bad as 22 nuclear weapons, which is a total lie. But anyway, so that's just an example of how an ideological conceptual framework really affects the culture. Because if that's what people start thinking, we got to go to war, right? We got to get out our technology. We've got to manipulate more and more. In other words, our desire to manipulate is perceived as the answer instead of being perceived as the problem. Um, and that, that really is a big deal. Um, Bill Gates is one on one side and he sort of represents the people who are looking to technology for solutions. And then there's Bandava Shiva, there's Earth Democracy. It's a big movement in India that really focuses on regenerating the soil. So regenerative agriculture, she focuses on um, the traditional farmers methods for keeping the, the earth fertile, right? They had wisdom, the ancient wisdom that had been developed. And so you have these two very different ideas of which direction to go in, but they're based on really a conceptual scheme, a whole orientation toward the world. And so ecofeminists will talk about how the male idea of dominating, right? Using his reason to dominate. And he does it with women, like you rape women, you rape the earth. You use women as the object of your gratification. You use the earth as the object of your pleasure and wealth, right? Gratification your gratification at becoming wealthy and at having a whole lot of stuff, right? So consumerism, materialism, perceives the natural world as an object for its project, right? I'm gonna make a name for myself by exploiting nature and being successful. So, um, so that, that's the, whole, the idea behind what it is to have a conceptual worldview. You use words in a certain way, and you have all sorts of symbols and um, cultural just kind of um, buttons that you can punch. And the, there's an analogy between the, the way women are perceived and the way the earth is perceived. So the other ways of thinking are that some things are more valuable than others, right? And so everything men identify with, reason, detachment, objectivity, success, you know, power, um, the ability to mold the future, progress, you know, all this stuff is um, a hierarchy. It's better than nature as cyclical, repetitive, 
the relationship between the generations. Every time a baby's born, you go through a lot of the same activities, a lot of the same kind of habituation. That stuff is women's work and it's not important, right? Then you have uh, value dualisms, reason versus um, emotion, right? The body versus the mind. And they're opposed to each other. That has been really hard on um, the environment, that attitude, and that metaphysical, that idea of reality. And then the, lo the logic of domination that you have. Oh, yeah. Here's a good one for people in developing countries. I don't know if you've ever heard this. Have you ever heard of the white man's burden? <laughs> Uh, maybe you can put in the chat if you've heard of it, but it's like, oh yes, you know, we are superior and we have, we set the stage for these developing countries and they're trying to be like us, but we have this duty, you know, and to go and give charity, a sort of pat them on the head, show them what to do because they're too stupid to know otherwise. It's just, it's, awful, right? It's disgusting. But that's, um, that's the logic of domination, right? We just have to dominate them, but that's all right. We'll just, you know, do it as our Christian charity. So, <laughs> but when men do that, they never change the system. They never help people help themselves. And they never take criticism, right? They've made, they've done all this stuff to get to that position, but then they'll just be generous. And then that's because they are so virtuous without any questioning of how they got there and um, problems, right? Of the whole system is rotten. They never, they don't rethink the system. Um, then there's a school of thought called deep ecology about valuing the earth in and of itself, not because it's human beings aren't going to live unless you value it. No, just because it's of value and that we don't have any right to, to uh, reduce the diversity. We do need to reduce our populations because we don't have a right to treat the natural world this way. Um, the irony about that was that it was developed, started out with a, a guy from Norway, and it was mostly privileged white Western men. And what they did was they started these wilderness protection movements, and some of them were in the US, but then they went to developing countries and they push indigenous people off the land in order to have their wilderness protection areas, right? And so even though it, it, it happened regardless of whether the people living there did have a sustainable way of life, right? If they had a sustainable way of life, then it, you know, it's plain old wrong for privileged white Westerners to come in there, push them off the land and say, this is wilderness protection, right? We're protecting them from the indigenous people. Now, if the indigenous people are living in an unsustainable way, because it's such a low standard of living, I think you could educate them to have a sustainable way of life. And that's what Vandava Shiva is upset about. One of the things, right? She just, she doesn't like the way these people get pushed off the land by environmentalists. Um, all right. So then we have this history. Whoops, 1978, I think was the year. And that was, I mean, I was an environmentalist starting in 1968. I think this was 1974. So right away, you know, I remember thinking these thoughts way back when high school. Um, 
And of course, because, because I did, I, my thoughts kept changing, right? Because first of all, I know it was obvious we were not trying to be sustainable, that the fossil fuel billionaires were winning the fight, right? That our, our political system got more and more bought out by fossil fuel. It more and more protected fossil fuels, um, even though there was this big consciousness raising in the 70s. Uh, but so, I mean, my view of what's best to do has to constantly be evolving. That's why I truly, even though I've thought about this, I am going to learn a lot from my students because there's so much I don't know. And there's so much that's just evolving. And there's a lot of stuff that I learned that's worthless now, right? I mean, it's that's not true anymore. So let's move on. Um, but well, one big issue is nuclear power. Uh, Bill Gates is recommending that in this interim between we don't have enough technology to figure out air, um, how to get energy from air and um, water and sun, right? The, the, fruit, the sources that just keep <laughs> giving. Um, so he's recommending more nuclear plants just to prevent carbon from getting in the air. Well, the trouble is, and I've known this for 50 years, is the waste products from nuclear uh, reactors. So then that's a huge problem. So there's some things that are still problems, but there's other things that are, um, um, I mean, we had a chance to go green 50 years ago and sell our green products to developing countries. That, that's what we should have done. I hope you can understand that without, <laughs> without you know, getting to, um, obsessed about that. But I mean, that was the idea that developing countries were going to develop. But if we sold them green products, then the people in the Middle East wouldn't get stinking rich off of oil. We would get rich. And um, because we were way ahead technologically. But we didn't do it. The fossil fuel billionaires controlled our political system so that we didn't do that. Um, but now, of course, the global issues, the exploitation of developing countries is, you know, it gets worse and worse because our own appetite for carbon does not go down, right? And people refuse to buy smaller cars. They refuse to do anything. They say, the government, you know, is a fascist dictatorship telling me what to do. They really do. <laughs> I'm not going to get vaccinated. I'm not going to wear a mask. The government, I don't want the government. This is China. This is fascism. And, and they are not going to, you know, have a lower carbon lifestyle. So Bill Gates, his book just says, well, everybody wants their electricity and he never tells people not to have the standard of living. All he's saying is, we're gonna meet all your needs through non-carbon means, okay? Which, you know, that's, I just think it's crazy to try and tell people not to change. And yet we're going to stop uh, the climate catastrophe without uh, Americans having to change. But that's, I mean, it's a typical uh, patriarchal way to go, right? <laughs> we're just going to keep having more technology. And so an ecofeminist points out that we're not changing any of our conceptual structure. We're not changing the, our values. We still want materialism. We still want technology. We just change it to green, you know, and then we can go on living. And the um, eco-feminists are really trying to say, no, 
No, it requires a totally different way of thinking and living. Um, and so that has been from the start, right? Has been getting over racism, sexism, classism, uh, changing the way people relate to each other and to nature, having it a context, right? It's not just a bunch of principles. It's a way of life. Um, it can be unbiased, which means it includes all perspectives, but it's not detached objectivity. It's very attached in a way of life. That's why to have that image of Artemis. Artemis is very attached to a way of life, right? And, or, and then it's, it values love, care, friendship. And the friendship one, you should remember from Artemis, a big deal with Artemis was the sisterhood, right? She had a group of sisters that were buddies and they sort of went out into the wilderness together and danced around a statue of Artemis and kind of got dizzy and fell to the ground, but they all like to hang out together. Um, so it's not, you don't detach reason from emotions. And again, that's why I use the goddess images. Um, and then in the book, it showed this. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking after this and put you into groups and then we'll go back to the outline again, but I'm gonna give you some time to talk to each other. But um, the lesson of the Sioux grandfather was that you, you know, you, um what hit the deer the four-legged in the back and you you hold its head and you look into its eyes and you apologize and you're grateful and then you quickly slip the neck so it so it um dies quickly and then contrast that um to the typical great white hunter hunter hunting for the pleasure of killing an animal so um, again, that's a stereotype, right? But I'll just tell you, I, where I used to live, hunting was huge in rural Arkansas. And so my students would tell me about that that was their bonding experience with their dad, okay? So my, um, my husband and my son, their bonding experience with their son is to go to a sports event, you know, and just sort of sit and talk while they're watching some um, basketball game or something. And I, it isn't, I just, I'm not involved in that. Um, not because I think it's lousy or good. It's just not my thing. Um, but so on the one hand, it's a bonding experience but it is like killing animals, you know? And um, when you live in the rural areas, so eco-feminists are aware that it's contextual. There's plenty of people in the world that need to eat animals for meat. They can't get enough protein or whatever. And they also don't raise them on factory farms and cause all that really horrible pollution that's just comes from a factory farm. But um, just the idea of killing um, animals is the way to bond. And the, the thing that stands out to me is that also in these same areas is where a lot of young men get recruited into the military, okay? And I did have a student once tell me that he was, he proudly told me this, that Arkansas has a lot of people in the military. And he said, well, that's because we're good shooters because we've been hunting for so long. And when at, in Arkansas, when you're 16, you have to take a test for gun safety uh, so that everybody knows how to use a gun. Um, and they get a little card, right? An ID card that shows they passed that test. So, so I don't know about what the rest of you might think of that, but America definitely has this incredible gun culture. 
and a, and an eco feminist, you know, would spot that and say, yeah, but that's part of the whole thing, right? It's just part of this culture of killing, killing an animal. It's just a cultural thing. It's a bonding. It's sort of, you know, man to man, you know, buddy stuff. <laughs> it's part of the civilizing experience of mentoring a young man into manhood or something. So, yeah, I think the average eco feminist would not think that was cool. Um, all right. So, I do have um, Sadia mentioned the Chipko movement. If some of you are aware of that, it's, uh, it's a great movement. You can look it up. The Green Belt Movement. Um, and that's another great one. And then um, Rahima, you can, um, you just stay after class and I'll talk to you, okay? I don't want you to, I do want everyone to get into groups and I'll put you in two groups. And there needs to be one person who takes on the leadership and asks and everybody thinks of something that struck them about what I've said so far or that they wanted to bring to class, that they wanted to talk about. That's number one, is what you wanted to talk about. Um, and then the next time we break into groups, then you do the example that you brought, okay? So the first one, the first group is on um, whatever random things you wanted to talk about or something I've talked about just now. And then the second time is a very specific example. So I will have talked about then the garment factory in um, Bangladesh by that time. Um, because I do, again, want you to make a distinction between the way people think about stuff and the culture and then specific examples that you would read in the news. Because I do want you to get this idea that when you read something in the news, you can step back and just think, oh my gosh, this is connected to all this other stuff. It's not just a random piece of information. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, okay, so Sadia, that's, that's good. And I, I'll read that while you're in groups, okay? And then I, and you can bring it up. So Sadia, why don't you bring that up in your group, and then you can bring it up to the bigger group too. So that's great. All right, so I'm just gonna break you into two groups and let you go, okay? Um, does anybody have a question before I do? Okay, there you go. Does everyone get invited? So Dulana, you add, those are the questions you ask me later, right? Not during class. Professor, can you invite me? Oh, are you not invited? Are people not invited? I thought you were invited to room one. Your name is there. Let's see. Okay, it says you haven't joined, but all right, I'll try putting in room two and see if that helps. Okay, so Delana, are you? connected to a different, some different thing than. Okay. Bristi, are you there? 
Risti, have you you've gotten invited? Did you get the invitation? I don't know. The picture actually my uh, like uh, Computer mice is not working there, so I cannot join. I okay. Okay, so, okay. So you can't join? I mean, if you can't join, you could just talk to me, so. Oh, okay, so it looks like you're gonna be able to join a room here, Delana. Let's see. Still not? Okay, Bristi. Bristi, are you able to join? Okay. Okay, so Delana and Bristi, do you want to just talk to me? Sir, I have already joined by my phone in Zoom too. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Because my computer mouse is not working and I cannot click. That's why I joined. By okay, my phone. thank you. Thanks for figuring that out. That's good. What about you, Bristi?
Reminding me, um, I get I get into the ideas, right? Okay, so um, think about when when you are on your machines and any sort of consumer product, you're thinking of yourself completely alienated from other people and you're thinking of yourself like everybody would want this or something. Think about the concept of yourself that gets created in order to make people into consumers. Um, it's really profound actually, because you detach yourself from the fact that you need other people, people need to work together, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, so then we have the other example of nature tourism. And I, the, I teach at Lyon College and Frank Lyon, whose father gave a huge amount of money to the school, he used to go on these African safaris. And, you know, they're super expensive. They're just for rich folk. And he went and killed these exotic animals. And in his house, he had a stuffed gazelle and he had a stuffed rhinoceros head and he had some other, right? Really exotic African animal. And I was just like, oh my God. But, but it ties into ecofeminism, right? It's the great white conqueror, you know? It ties into colonialism. It ties into... You know, you show what a macho guy you are by um, going and, and especially these exotic animals. Um, and then there is ecotourism, which is interesting. Some ecotourism is, does more harm to the environment, right? Because people fly there to go. Some of it is um, you just destroy the environment while you're while you're camping or hiking or whatever. And the other thing is, I mean, the real ecotourism would be the Sierra Club has these trips where you clean up a path, right? You clean up an area, <laughs> that's work, that's work, but that's not normally what ecotourism is, but that would be a kind of ecotourism that would actually help something. Um, so women's bodies, there's an analogy there between, you know, these exotic animals and women. Um, okay, so what is real freedom? Then there's a section on vegetarianism. And first, and then you can in your groups, here's an assignment for your groups. Think of some other way that you use animals for human products, right? So we have food, shoes, purses, soap, the down in your comforter. You think, each of you could think of something where you use an animal to create this product that's completely unnecessary. Um, contextual vegetarians, some people in developing countries need to eat meat. Um, it's a context, it's not an absolute. But in developed nations, they don't really need it. Peter Singer's thing is that any animal that's capable of suffering has to be taken into consideration. Um, Tom Reagan said that you shouldn't kill any sentient being because they have ca the capacity for having a history, a life history, right? They have children, they raise their children, they. Um, you know, they have this extended consciousness. And so he says you shouldn't kill them at all. Um, a species is, a species ist says that we shouldn't favor our species, right? And um, so that's, that's the, again, the empathy for other creatures, the equality, the respect is, is analogous to the way men have dominated women. They're not as rational, so they don't need to be paid attention to as much, right? They don't need to be respected as much. It's okay to use them to raise your kids for you, to service your sex life for you, to take care of you when you're sick, right? So, um, so there's analogies there. 
Uh, environmental ecofeminism focuses on the environment, the critiques of it. Okay, so whenever you have a big woman, a big movement, a big intellectual movement, you always have a lot of criticism back and forth. So one of the criticisms is that it celebrates the woman nature connection. And that's always been used to denigrate women. And women really want equality in higher order intellectual capacities, political power, economic power, um, creative, artistic creativity, scientific inquiry, all this stuff that's not, you know, non-human animals are not capable of. So when you reduce women back to associating them with nature and protecting nature, you're reducing them, you're dehumanizing them. The spiritual ecofeminism is not secular enough. So the ecofeminist movement was an intellectual movement, political movement, an activist movement. Now, the way I do the spiritual stuff is that I, you know, I link these two together, but traditionally they have been at odds with each other. Um, so, and then some of the affluent women didn't want to change their way of life that much. They thought it was too radical, which of course exposes the fact that the movement tended to be among privileged white women. Um, it associates women with the irrational, natural thing. Um, it locates women, out, Western women outside of Western culture. So they're supposedly critiquing Western men, but they're really very privileged themselves. Um, and, then, and then they imply women have this role to care and nurture uh, and that they're unique, right? They're better at men than interconnecting us, but that's not right, right? Men should be just as responsible for childcare as women. Women should have just as much access to world building as men. So those are some of the disagreements. Then I had the, um, the reading about the example of the um, garment industry. And um, so I just had you reading it, you know, give you the examples, the facts. Now, what's interesting here is that it's a long, essay, right? It's a long presentation, 125, 121 pages. So if you do an ecofeminist analysis of it, it would involve talking about how the global economic system, how it exploits nature and it exploits women. It exploits women in developing countries. It exploits poorer women in developing countries, right? So that would be that same kind of analysis the treatment of women is like the treatment of nature. You could talk about the resource exploitation. Where do they get their raw materials uh, from which they make the, the clothing, right? That's exploiting nature. Do they, you know, you look at all the analysis, then you look at all the carbon footprint in getting those resources, those raw materials to the factory. Then you look at all the um, carbon related um, activity that goes on within the factory. Then you look at the fact that um, they use whatever resources they need to to make something look uh, beautiful to a woman or to a man, a woman who's trying to get the male gaze. And then they control people's taste about what it is that is beautiful and then they try to convince men and women that they absolutely have to buy this stuff in order to be attractive or attracted. It's just layers and layers and layers and layers of stuff that ends up with factories collapsing, right? And pollution, air pollution, water pollution, uh, soil pollution. So that, that would be the kind of thing so now I want you to break in groups and give your example of some specific example in your country, hopefully, of women who particularly suffer from an environmental situation. Um, 
All right. Does everybody understand the assignment? I hope so. Um, whoops. Okay, I'm, I got you in the same groups this time. So are all of you able, are you able to go into the groups? Oops. Okay, do we have a spokesperson from one of the groups about examples students brought? Anybody want to speak? We talked about some natural disaster that happened in our country and which uh, uh, not very specifically, but affected women. Like in Bangladesh, uh, it's a riverine country and uh, now and then floods comes and women particularly faces a uh, real problem regarding the shelter or medicating the pregnant women and, uh, um, and also yes, this kind of women. And then we talked about Mm, the garments industry, which is uh, the economics backbone of our country, and then the disaster. Some comes in news and some does not, but now and then very uh, fire uh, fire issues and then collapse, building collapsing issues affects women because most of the workers in garments industry mostly is women. Yeah. Okay. The other group? Uh, <clears throat> professor, so uh, like uh mahira discussed uh, we also came up with this idea like you know many of the uh, women's works in garment industries and they have you know different kind of issues and we came up with the uh, you know like idea that women should be uh, provided with an environment where, can, where they can work you know in a proper way uh, so that they don't have to face uh, much issues regarding, you know, women safety or, you know, like, you know, harassment, these things, because, you know, in the workplace, still women are facing these issues. So secondly, Sadia came up with this, uh, you know, movement where in Chittagong, Bangladesh, they're uh, in place called, uh, <clears throat> uh, I forgot the name, sorry. But in Chittagong, uh, uh, lastly, uh, there was a movement uh, against, uh, you know, like the environmental, uh, regarding environment where uh, there was a party where uh, they were trying to build an, uh, you know, hospital in front of area where people used to uh, like sit because there used to be a lot of greenery and they wanted to make a hospital over there and many of the people went against it and you know they stopped um, the another party to not to make the hospital because it was such an environment friendly area so uh, yes professor we came up with this two idea about like how women empowerment made this happen like stopped uh, an area which was you know environmentally friendly and also with the idea of providing uh, women safety in the industries as well. Okay, good. Yeah. I would like to add with that, it was an area where the tree was uh, for thousand years. It was so big tree and there were in that area, all the trees were living for thousand years. And if that tree would yeah. get cut, then there would be uh, temperature increase and uh, very much, uh, it would be a very much bad situation for people. Uh, rising temperature and that movement stopped the tree to cut. Good. I, so what I do want to emphasize is that everything we talk about, okay, so now we have these goddesses types, we have these 
intellectual movements, we have these activist movements, we have these events. And then when there is an event, I want you to emphasize what NGOs or you know, what movements, how are women coming back and you know, trying to make the culture different, right? So the, the ecofeminism will tell you what's the mentality that got us here in the first place and how radically it needs to shift. And then the, the particular things is how is it that women are showing that they're changing the mentality, right? They're rejecting the culture and they're speaking out and they're trying to make change on each one of these issues. So that by the end of the semester, I would, I would like you to just get this huge big picture of all the stuff going on. But everybody has to want to donate something about their country, right? Everybody can contribute something different because they come from a different country. If you're from Bangladesh, you might pick a different country, but you don't have to, because I want you to know about your country and then about other countries. Anyway, I have to let you go. Next week we do Apollo, which is Artemis's twin brother, but a lot of women now are being trained in Apollonian types of stuff. And so that's what we're, that's where we're headed. All right, so have a good five days and the posts are due in, um, you know, <laughs> I guess Friday at by noon, by Friday noon, somewhere between Thursday noon and Friday noon. Um, okay, okay go ahead. I know you have another class, so go, go. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Have, have a nice day. day. Thank you, Professor. Bye. 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 Professor, uh, I'm right. here. Yep. So I, I'm going to, I'll hang around and, um, you know, explain. Do you want me to go through the syllabus a bit? Oh, let's see. I'll stop the uh, recording. Let me stop the recording here.